Hey there! Did you know Kroger always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Kroger app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Kroger today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Grainger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Hey everyone, Ray here. So in case you missed it the first time, let me tell you about a new book. In best-selling author Simon Scarrow's brisk and chilling new historical mystery set in 1940 Berlin, Dead of Night, criminal Polizei inspector Horst Schanke is a seasoned and conflicted detective, but he is not supportive of the Third Reich, thus putting a target on his back. And soon the Nazi brass are warning him to shut down his investigations into a series of murders that initially seemed unconnected. In the process, he will uncover a stomach-churning SS scheme, and nothing ends well when dealing with the SS. Detective Schenke's world is already one of terror, fear, murder, and power by any means necessary, and those same techniques will be used against him. Simon Scarrow is a London Sunday Times number one best-selling historical thriller author who has sold more than five million books. His gifts for accuracy, tension, and dread will leave you breathless. Dead of Night from Kensington Publishing is available everywhere books are sold. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast. Episode 454, Army Group South is on the march. Last time, we saw Army Group Center, with all its imperfections, get to within miles of the Kremlin. The closest penetration was to the north of the capital, almost as close, just in front of the great Russian city, but not so much to the south, for various reasons. The point is, in early December, a halt was called to this great enterprise, with the idea being of starting up again in a few days. But Stalin got in first, with his counteroffensive. The best place to start in any story is at the beginning. And as we are now two-thirds of the way through this prequel, it's worth remembering that one, the majority of the Wehrmacht traveled through Russia on foot, and two, Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels would not show a map of Soviet Russia to the German people. He did not want them obsessing about its vastness, like their soldiers probably were. No, he wanted them to keep their head down and keep producing for the state, whether it was goods or babies, or both. And of course, there is Hitler's now famous or infamous statement, you only need to kick in the door and the whole rotten structure will come crashing down. But it's worth taking a look at that rotten structure. After all, though the czarist and then provisional governments fell at the end of the Great War, the Communist Party had triumphed and was still around. Even more, they completely controlled the country, which will turn out to be a vital requirement in responding to Operation Barbarossa. But for every German victory, and there were many of them, big and small, there were still Soviet troops, tanks, artillery, and planes in the way. Point being, by the time the first freezing temperatures arrived in October, the Wehrmacht had been weakened, and they still had a ways to go. But again, let's start at the beginning. At 1 a.m. June 22, 1941, a Sunday, the word wanton was passed through Army Group South, which was led by Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt. This meant that, in two hours' time, Operation Barbarossa would be launched. Along Army Group South's 800-mile front, von Rundstedt had the most international mix of Axis troops prepared to move out. Hungarian, Italian, Romanian, and Slovakian units would help von Rundstedt with his assigned goals, namely 
destroy all enemy troops before them, take the Ukrainian capital of Kiev, capture the Dnieper River crossings, seize the Donets Basin, or Donbass, and finally open and keep open the way to the Caucasus oil fields just east of the Black Sea. It might not have been as glamorous as taking Moscow, but all these objectives were vital to removing Soviet Russia from the map and securing a German victory. But for all this importance, Army Group South only had been given one panzer group. But after taking down France so quickly, Berlin would have had a hard time even picturing anything other than victory. This would work. It would just take time. But even here, the big personalities influenced events. Stalin believed it would be in the South that the Germans would strike the hardest. Thus, it would be given more material, better material, and solid leadership. Before the shooting started, this massive area had been broken into the Kiev Special Military District and the Odessa Military District. But after June 22, 1941, they were incorporated into a larger defensive area. Kiev was now the southwestern front, and Odessa the southern front. Lieutenant General M. P. Kurpanos, the leader of the forces around Kiev, had some of Moscow's best equipment, and equally important, Stalin's support. Odessa is due south of Kiev by some 294 miles, or 473 kilometers, and there, Lieutenant General Tuluniev led the Southern Front. Yet both generals were far less static in their defense than the other fronts. First, they used Stalin's order of no provocative gestures that would upset the Germans. Kurpanis and Tuluniev interpreted this by working with the NKVD border troops. Otherwise, it would have been impossible to spread out their frontline fighters and hide them. But more importantly, when Barbarossa kicked off and Stalin was dazed, at least at first, these men agreed to push back when it was advantageous for them to do so, but when not, to pull back in an organized way. This worked out well for the two fronts, and they quickly put von Rundstedt behind schedule. But any successes would quickly collapse when Stalin issued orders for them to stand fast, or even worse, go on the offensive when not prepared. And this, combined with Army Group Center eventually sending Army Group South most of their panzers, would see the collapse of Kiev and almost one million Soviet soldiers trapped in a massive pocket. Yet as much as Stalin screwed up his southern general's ability to resist, Hitler would do the same when he reversed course and sent some of South's panzers to Army Group Center for their attack on Moscow, which, as we saw, did not pan out. And much like what had happened around the capital, the Stavka was, somehow, able to fill the massive hole left by the trapped men at Kiev, which delayed Army Group South enough for winter to arrive. Then, it was a different kind of war. Although the war on the Eastern Front would eventually become personal, to the point that Hitler could see little else, it's worth remembering that Hitler invaded Russia for two special reasons. First, he wanted the space, resources, and slave labor that European Russia could give to the Third Reich. He had stated all of this in Mein Kampf, written when he was in prison after the failed Beer Hall Putsch. Second, as London had refused to meet him halfway by giving him free reign in Europe while the British were able to keep their empire, Hitler wanted the UK's last possible ally removed from the war and the United States was simply too far away. Besides, Hitler had never thought much of the Slavic race, and he considered it a favor to the world. So war it was to be. Total war. But what really pushed this decision to attack to become reality was simply Hitler was talked back to, and he really did not like that. And who had been the offender? Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov, back in mid-November 1940. For a few years now, Russia had been supplying Germany with oil, manganese ore, and other items in exchange for finished goods from the steelmaker Krupp of Essen, like locomotives, diesel engines, machine tools, and tanks. 
Yet after the August 1939 Molotov-Ribbentrop Agreement, it was clear to both sides that they would soon be at each other's throats. And if that was the case, then much of what Stalin was sending to Berlin, oil, wheat, and other resources, needed to stay home in order to build up Russia's defenses. Hence, going back to the mid-November 1940 visit of Molotov to Berlin, by the time the two-day talks were over, Hitler was incensed and at that moment moved up his attack on Russia. No one spoke to Der Fuhrer like that, ever. It was getting personal from the outset. Which may partially explain why Hitler did not invite his Axis partners, Italy and Japan, into the planning stage of Barbarossa. No, instead, he would rely on his smaller partners in Eastern Europe, like Slovakia. It deeply appreciated being separated from the Czechs, and in return, they would be the first ones to sign up for this coming battle. As for Romania, they had, for a long time, depended on France as a protector, but it was gone now, and as Romania feared Soviet territorial ambitions, they too were in the German camp. And lastly, Hungary would contribute a small force of men to be able to say, yes, we helped. Having said all this, Soviet Russia was still a massive country and would not go down easily or quickly. But the outcomes so far of the Blitzkrieg was that any enemy that was not ready to fully fight on day one would not have the time to eventually get their act together. And though some of Hitler's officers were hesitant to take on Russia, Hitler's victory so far silenced open criticism. Besides, when Army Group South's victories started bringing into Germany the Ukraine's agriculture and industrial might, the world leader would once again be vindicated. And yet, for all of Stalin's supposed hard work, ruthlessness, and paranoia, his country was actually relatively weak on June 22, 1941, when the Axis forces came raging over the border. First, his purges of the mid-1930s hurt him the most on the battlefield. Those men who had led from the front or were used to dealing with large formations of men were now dead. At least 700,000 men were now dead. And much of the reason for this came from a trusted report that had previously told Stalin a certain percentage of officers were disloyal. To wit, Stalin, thinking logically, replied, well, if a certain percentage is disloyal, then we need to have that many removed. Sadly, it now seems that the report was anticipating what Stalin would want to hear, and so told him so. But the purges would come full circle that summer and fall of 1941. Next, any European ally Stalin might have had were no longer picking up the phone. They had already either been conquered or were too afraid of upsetting Berlin. On the positive side, Soviet paramilitary units had been training millions of men to work radios, drive cars, ride horses, fly a plane, and how to be a sniper. And the number of Soviet men in uniform when the Germans attacked was around 5 million. But again, they were new to this, and so were their officers. Another bright spot was, and this is where Stalin's distrust of everyone paid off, his second and third five-year plans had war production factories set up closer to the Ural Mountains than its border with the former Poland. What's more, because Stalin gobbled up more land before Barbarossa was kicked off, that just meant Germany had to fight more and longer just to take the land that had not been Russia's, like the three Baltic states, taken in 1940, Romanian Bessarabia, parts of Finland, and of course, the eastern half of Poland. But fate would see that both leaders saw the South as the most important area. Stalin, judging others by his own standards, believed that Hitler would want to keep Soviet troops as far away from the Romanian oil fields as possible. That, combined with the assumed stealing of the agricultural resources of the Ukraine, meant that Germany would place their main strike here. And if that was the case, then Russia would be wise to strengthen this area, which helps explain the massive amount of carnage coming soon. 
When 65-year-old Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt's 797,000 men in occupied Poland and his 175,000 soldiers in Romania set out, the Field Marshal was full of hope and confidence. After all, few other Germans could say anything bad about him, professionally speaking, and his list of accomplishments made it clear why he was chosen for such a prestigious position. It had been von Rundstedt that led Germany's main efforts during the Polish attack, as well as the attack in the West. And now here he was to balance that out with a successful attack in the East. Of course, what he nor any other German knew was that on June 22, 1941, Stalin had, again, around 5 million men in uniform, and there would be more coming. Yet von Rundstedt had his own advantages, if not overwhelming manpower. Coming with him, indeed, much was expected of them in the coming fight, were two SS divisions, the Liebstandata SS Adolf Hitler and the SS Motorized Division Viking. As these units had come from Hitler's personal bodyguard, these men were the physical specimens that embodied, no pun intended, Hitler's supermen. Besides, being the most loyal to the leader, they got the best of everything, in terms of, well, everything. On the flip side, the air arm of Army Group South could and should have been stronger, if not for the less-than-victorious outings against the British and other pilots during the Battle of Britain. Luftflot IV, joining von Rundstedt, was told to keep a strong presence over the Romanian oil fields, or the Panzers would have no legs. Still, all concerned thought that victory was just over there, somewhere out there on the Russian steppe as Army Group South was told the same as the other two groups. For now, simply destroy all enemy soldiers before you, or trap them. And though much has been made, rightly so, of the weak logistics for Barbarossa, Hitler expected his men to live off the land, much as Napoleon's men had. But that would be cancelled out by Stalin's scorched-earth policy. The Pact of Steel, signed by Germany and Italy just months before World War II broke out, sounds unbreakable. But there were cracks even before Russia was invaded. First, Hitler did not let Mussolini in on the planning of Barbarossa. Still, the bombastic Il Duce created the Italian Expedition Corps in Russia, or CSIR. The CSIR was made up of about 62,000 men, but Italy unfortunately, brought their military methodology with them. Namely, their officers rarely saw or spoke to their men, and the Italians brought no vehicles with them. The Germans were none too happy about this, but that was nothing compared to how the Italians felt. After all, if all went well, that means they would have to walk to the Crimea. Sadly, almost 9,000 of these men would never see Italy again. And finally, the day came, June 22, 1941. In the early morning hours, von Rundstedt's almost one million soldiers, broken into one panzer group and five armies, with tens of thousands of vehicles, horses, tanks, guns, and planes, moved out. But theirs was only a part of the overall three million men, 600,000 vehicles, 750,000 horses, 3,580 tanks, 7,184 guns, and 1,830 airplanes. At 3 a.m., 15 minutes before Barbarossa started, the last train out of the USSR side of the former Poland crossed the San River at Szemszel, 140 miles or 225 kilometers to the southeast of Warsaw. Again, this was a part of the massive trade between the two behemoths that convinced Stalin Germany would not attack, at least not yet, as Germany needed the material. But today, Hitler was seeking glory, not minerals. About 100 miles or 100 kilometers due east of this river crossing, now into Soviet territory, sits Ternopil, and there Lieutenant General M.P. Kerponos commander of the Kiev Special Military District, had a bad feeling about the day. 
No one could tell Stalin anything about a German invasion and not get in trouble for it, but Kirpanos knew that if they did invade and he failed to defend this sector, he would die. Nuts to that, so after the train crossed the river, he ordered units to move forward, as there was still darkness to hide their movement. One such unit was the 37th Rifle Corps that was, on paper, in training which is probably why he also added the NKVD border troops to move with them. And it's a good thing that he did, because at 3.15 a.m., men of the reconnaissance unit, the German 101st Light Infantry Division, along with commandos, rushed the Schemschel Bridge to secure it. They were joined by almost every gun Rundstadt had, which opened up aiming for roads, communication hubs, but most importantly for now, border fortifications along his entire front. But this initial attack on the bridge failed. The Russians held them back, both sides losing men, but the Germans also lost time. To be sure, later that day, regular German forces, in overwhelming numbers, would take the bridge. Besides, the defenders would have to pull back as their flanks had been compromised. But Kirpanus was just getting started. Now that the attack had finally come, he ordered the 15th and 8th Mechanized Corps to stop the 48th Panzer Corps in front of them. Unfortunately, the 8th Corps was stationed 300 miles away, and thus the initial defense of the area was done in piecemeal, which played beautifully into the Germans' hands. Meanwhile, the fighters and bombers of the Luftwaffe crossed the border to harass enemy units, shoot Soviet planes out of the sky, and attacked anyone trying to set up a more solid defense. Also, as the German guns were tilted up to aim further into the enemy's rear, their infantry, the German infantry, moved out. Pulling them out of hiding spaces along the Sand River, rubber boats were filled with men and paddled over. Thus was no territory on the Russian side not immediately threatened. On the far left or northern flank of von Rundstedt's area of responsibility was Field Marshal von Reichenau, commander of the 6th Army. Reichenau had supported Hitler literally when the latter purged the SA in June 1934. In fact, he was the author of the personal oath to Hitler that all members of the Wehrmacht had to take, which is why they could not stop fighting until Hitler killed himself. But that's putting the cart before the horse. Reichenau's 56th and 62nd Infantry Divisions from the 17th Army Corps manned the territory on Army Group South's far left flank, and they moved out as well. Helped by artillery and Luftwaffe, they were able to advance some 14 kilometers, or eight and a half miles that first day, which is very respectable for infantry on foot. And this was achieved while taking on two Soviet divisions. And when they were far enough, they and other units would protect Army Group South from any attacks coming out of the Privet Marshes to their immediate north. As the three Army Groups pushed on at 1 p.m. that first day, Stalin, still in shock, ordered Zhukov to talk to Kirpanos in Ternopil. Yet, as the Luftwaffe had taken control of the skies that day, Zhukov had to wait until darkness to fly in. He did, and right away he saw that Kirpanos' aggressive flexibility had slowed down the attack enough so that they could match more rifle divisions with tank or anti-tank brigades, as this seemed to be effective. This would lead to more German slowness and headaches. But the numbers would not be enough. Not yet. That was in the future. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So we finally got into Army Group South. We'll see how they go with uh, the amazing things they're able to achieve and then watch them suffer because, you know, hubris. Anyway, so I'd like to say hi to the latest members. Uh, Let's see here. Vitaly Goling. I probably butchered that. I'm very sorry. From American Fork, Utah. Uh, D. Grice from Grays Lake, Illinois. Thank you very much. Is it Scott Mapes 
from Akron, New York. Scott, if I butcher the last name, I am very sorry. Joshua Richardson from Knoxville, Tennessee. Why can't everybody be from Knoxville? Because I can say Knoxville. More importantly, I can read it. Anyway, so um, I'm kind of in a giddy mood. I don't know why. I think maybe just the sugar from a drink hit me. But anyway, as far as those who have donated, let's see, there's Riley Victoria from Australia. And then James Murray. Now, James Murray is a special case. I think he's donated before, but he's offered, he sent me a very nice uh, message and he offered me something. My wife fell in love with him quicker than I did. So there might be some issues there, but I'll I'll, I'll straighten it out. out, Don't worry. And I got a lovely email from a Mr. Dirks in Poland. So thank you very much for that. He was telling me about the the local history where he's at, uh, the post office. Um, Hopefully one day, I'm still trying to get to the UK, but after that, and after there's no more war in Russia and the Ukraine, maybe to be safe to travel to Poland once again. So we are we now have Army Group South launched. We will take it as far as we can go, and then we will pick up with the uh, the general story of Barbarossa and go from there and spend quite a bit of time on it. Take care, everyone.